I've been here now in your country for such a long time. Looking around the room, I would say that probably the majority of you, with a few notable exceptions without naming any names, were probably about this high when I first came here. It was the 1990s. And I was in Australia and I was young. Uh, and I, I was full of adventure and I wanted to travel. And because of this, I found myself at an interview at an airport in Brisbane where I answered a job which basically says, are you an accountant? Do you want to work abroad? I didn't even know what country this was in respect to. The crazy thing was, after the interview, because of my enthusiasm and just craziness, I guess, I still didn't have it any idea where the country was that they were trying to sell to me. It wasn't until two days later about when I got a fax, yes a fax, from my employer. Oh, by the way, I accepted the job pretty much on the spot without giving it any thought at all. So my employer, uh, I got this fax and there it was, amongst other things, written down in black and white, Kazakhstan. Where the hell is Kazakhstan? This is the questions that I was inundated with from my family and friends and basically from everybody because nobody had heard of Kazakhstan, let alone knew where it was. So I headed off to the library in Melbourne. This is obviously pre-internet days. And being a library, well, it was good but a lot of the information was out of date and old and a lot of it was a bit slanted to the Western way of thinking as I can see now. And there was nothing there though, as I can remember, there was nothing about the great people that are here, or the, the geography, or the, or the lifestyle, it was all, everything that I remember reading was all like in negative connotations. There was, that was where I first read about political prisoners, Kazakh gulags. Where's Gorka? She's here. That was where I first learned about Gorka's birthplace, the secret closed cities of Kazakhstan with their military installations and preparing for warfare. Jadra. That was where I first read about your, your polygon region. Ironically, that was actually where I was heading even though I didn't know it at the time. Naturally, I didn't tell my mother about any of this stuff. If, even if I had mentioned the word Stan in Kazakhstan, she would have had severe heart palpitations, so I wasn't going to go there. So instead, I just told everybody that I was going to some place near China. And I was going to go for 6 to 12 months and I'll be home. Having answered this question of where is Kazakhstan, I had my next question I had to answer. What the hell is there in Kazakhstan? What do they do there? What do they have? Apparently not a lot. If this fax that I had received from my employer was any indication. You see, there it was stated amongst other formalities. It was stated that, Greg, if you actually want something, uh, you need something to live, to survive, something for comfort or whatever, you best bring it with you because chances are you won't find it in Kazakhstan. So with this in mind, I, I packed accordingly, and amongst my clothes and personal belongings, I, I put in food in my luggage, I put in medicine, books, I even put in my stereo. My big boombox ghetto blaster, perhaps you've heard of them, they're iconic from the 1990s, it was like this big. It had two big speakers, the cassette deck at the front, it was, it was mighty. My dad even built me a box, a purpose-built box for a sturdy and strong and enabled me to enable this boombox to travel halfway across the world without being damaged. However, I was just ecstatic about this. I couldn't think of not having it. How was I going to listen to my Bon Jovi and Guns and Roses and etc. when I was in this, this wasteland called Kazakhstan. There was nothing there apparently. But being an inexperienced traveller, I forgot about one key thing and that was the weight of the box. So you can imagine my surprise when I get to the Melbourne airport and checked in and they told me how much this was going to cost me to travel the, to get this box on the plane. $500. $500! Five 
My boombox was like $200 tops. It just wasn't worth it. But to be damned with it, I just paid it and went on my way. But that wasn't the end of the story. You see, in those days, in those days, there was no real direct routes into Kazakhstan from Australia. The preferred route was via Europe, and then you had to backtrack into Kazakhstan. So I was in Frankfurt, Germany, and I was collecting all my bags and my boombox, and I had to go to the checking process again. You can probably know where the story is going. And there I was at the, at the Lufthansa desk, and there was this eloquent young lady, or I mean, she may, he may have been a man, I don't know, that was giving me, that gave me the bad news. Guten Morgen, Herr Hiva. Hmm, what have we here? Ah, this is a nice box. Hmm, this is a heavy box. Ah, this will cost you 500 Deutsche Marks. 300 dollars equivalent. Oh my goodness, I, I was beside myself. I, I was actually, I just didn't know what to do. But then it occurred to me something which, I remember something which I just read the week or so before in the Melbourne Library. And I got this vision of Kazakhstan, of these queues outside of Kazakhstan shops. And I got this vision of these same shops with like bare shelves and barren shelves. So I became comforted and I went over to the desk where I had to pay the excess baggage. And I paid willingly. And then I walked back to the check-in counter with my two suitcases in tow and my now $1,000 stereo on my shoulder. I eventually made it to Kazakhstan. It's almost been 20 years now that I've been here and I can honestly say that it has a very close part, close in my heart. And I actually call it home. To the extent that and because of the fact that I have very infrequent trips back to see my family, I can honestly say now, where the hell is Australia? <laughs>